On September 26, 2013, the official Persona Twitter account tweeted something interesting. They were launching a new website, p-ch.jp. On it, there was a date and time listed, Sunday, November 24th, 8 p.m. Japanese Standard Time, or JST. And six cities in Japan were listed below it. There were also three boxes placed above the date. Many people immediately suspected that this was a teaser for the highly anticipated reveal of Persona 5, especially since the sequel to Persona 4's spin-off fighting game, Persona 4 Arena, had just been officially announced on the same day, even if it had been revealed in other ways before, just days before the appointed date. On November 19th, the website was updated. The previously empty boxes had been filled. Each box now contained a picture of Persona 4's own Teddy. If you clicked on an image of him, it would change into another one. And if you matched three of the same images in a row, they would all shake before resetting to three differing images. Two days later, on November 21st, at 8pm JST, the website was updated again. This time, it featured a live stream with a countdown timer. During this multi-day stream, there would be several small events broadcasted. Some of them featured various characters from the Persona series. Once the countdown timer was finished, a one hour long live stream began, and it was hosted by Teddy and Noriko Shoji. The website had also been transformed into the Persona channel, a new hub for Persona games that replaced the previous one, p-atlas.jp. As expected, Atlas had some games to reveal. Over the course of the stream, Atlas announced that Persona 4 Arena Ultimax was coming to consoles, a new spin-off title Persona Q was also in the works, and they unveiled a Persona 5 teaser trailer. Side note, in each of the cities that were previously listed on the website, all of the announcements, other than Persona 5, were broadcasted on large televisions. However, these weren't the only games that were announced. There was another, much more curious one. Since Persona 4 Arena had been released, maybe some people were expecting to see Atlas experiment with some other genres. But I doubt many people saw this one coming. Scheduled to be released in the fall of 2014, Persona fans would have the chance to see some of their favorite characters brought to life in the series' first rhythm game. While it came as a shock to fans, developers at Atlas had been thinking about making a Persona-related rhythm game for a while, but they weren't confident that they'd be able to make it a good one. They just didn't have any experience in making that kind of game. This idea kind of just sat in their minds until they completed Persona 4 Arena, which established a new method of developing games for Atlas, co-development, according to Kazuhisa Wada, the game's director. The Persona series' music has always been highly regarded by the players, and we've had a lot of success with large-scale live concerts, a fairly rare achievement for game music. That's why we had been thinking for quite some time, it would be nice to make a Persona music game if the timing was right. However, we didn't have the know-how for developing music games specifically, and that was a huge bottleneck in actually getting the project started. Then came the Persona 4 Arena series, in which I was the director. I worked with Arc System Works, an illustrious fighting game developer, and together we were able to make this non-RPG Persona title a success. The experience showed us the potential of co-development with another company, and gave us the confidence to move ahead with the P4D project. The developer that they decided to work with this time around was Dingo who made their name in the rhythm genre with the Hatsune Miku Project Diva series on the PlayStation Portable. They worked on three games, Project Diva, Project Diva Second, and Project Diva Extend, releasing them in that order every year from 2009 to 2011. Bringing an experienced rhythm game developer on board was what Atlas needed to move forward with the project, and while it's easy to compare the two, this was obviously going to be a very different development experience than what they had done previously in Persona 4 Arena, and there weren't going to be a lot of things that they could directly apply to the P4D project. However, the experience was still valuable, if for no other reason than because it gave them new challenges to overcome and new problems to solve. Well, I'd say that music games and fighting games don't particularly share a whole lot in common, much like how they're both wildly different from RPGs in general. But obviously at their core, both arena games and Dancing All Night share that common background of being new and interesting challenges for us. In that respect, my time with the arena games has helped me learn to be more flexible and accommodating of new ideas when branching out. If nothing else, it's been fun and refreshing to think and work outside of the usual box for all of these games. And speaking of challenges, one of the first ones that they had to deal with was making sure that the game's gameplay, characters, and setting worked well together. It was a huge challenge. The characters themselves were already well established, so we just put them on the stage and let them be themselves. But that stage itself was the hard part. An RPG setting is based on its story. This time though, we had to come up with the setting that revolved around the gameplay instead, to better suit a music game. On a side note, working on Persona 4 Arena wasn't as tough even though it was a fighting game, since the concept of battle is a major component in RPGs as well. In P4D's case, we had to balance the setting and the game system, so we worked on those two elements in sync, being conscious of maintaining the signature Persona feel at all times. There was a lot of going back and forth between the staff members during the planning phase, adding and cutting out things to both the story setting and the game system as they continued their heated discussion. 
This title was an opportunity to develop Persona 4 characters further and show new sides of them. So in the end, I think we managed to put a good portion of our creative efforts in the game. I have to admit though, there were many things we simply had to cut from the final game due to time constraints. In the entire Persona 4 family, P4D might be where we stepped out of our comfort zone the most, to the point where fans might be worried. The game's characters were always going to be one of its selling points, so they had to make sure that each of their personalities were distinct and recognizable. One of the ways that they did this was by making sure each character had their own unique dancing style that suited their personalities. The cast of Persona 4 has attracted a lot of really passionate fans, so it's important that their support be respected in this new game by maintaining that recognizability. One of the ways we ensure that is by having a different dancer assigned to each character for motion capturing, and then having the team look over the choreography to ensure every character's personality remains intact in the moves that they make. So Yosuke for instance, he takes after male idols with some hip hop flair to his moves, whereas Chie's got her usual kung fu mixed with some street dancing sensibilities. And then Yukiko, her moves are derived from ballet while still retaining aspects of her ditziness. People were D had another interesting challenge to overcome when it came to the characters, character modeling. While they had used polygonal character modeling in the original game on the PS2, they weren't planning on recycling those assets. We regarded the character models as a major facet of this game. What you're seeing here is actually our second stab at rendering the cast in this style for Dancing All Night. We did another complete run in this manner previously, but we made them all from scratch. The reason for that is we wanted to make them all more attractive in ways we couldn't previously achieve with the form style we had going with the original Persona 4. So we set out to redo them in such a way to draw out those new qualities. Naoto's a good example of this. She's not who she used to be during Persona 4, where she was carrying so much weight about her identity. So now she can really start embracing her femininity and how she looks, and not have it adversely affect her. But of course, you don't want necessarily everyone in the game to have sex appeal going for them either. Nanako's in the game too, and if she was out being flamboyant and provocative, that'd be completely out of character. Getting her motions down pat was therefore really hard. We had an idol come in for Nanako, rather than an actual child dancer, but no matter what they did, Nanako's moves still had a certain allure to them that was off so we had to spend a long time fine-tuning her animation to get it to where we needed it to be. Most all of the other characters have their outfits rooted in their school uniforms, but we wanted someone that could wear something more gaudy to provide a contrast to that. It's also important just as a matter of helping to establish Dancing All Night as its own distinct thing separate from other Persona games. Teddy ended up filling that role for us, though his dance moves come from gymnastics, which I feel makes for an interesting combination in tandem with the costume. As for other characters, Naoto's dances come from house music, placing a big emphasis on deliberate step routines, and all wrapped up in a certain layer of sex appeal. And then Kanji's style is fundamentally rooted in the type of dance known as locking, but with some modifications to it, as real locking has some moves that just don't really jive with his character. The development staff is really fussy about getting those details right for each character. With Rise, it's probably pretty obvious, but her dances are a little mischievous, the sort you often see in the idol world she's from. Obviously, she's running around in a pretty revealing outfit while she dances. What you see underneath in a few places isn't actual underwear or anything like that. It's all a part of a getup that's meant to be seen, as to avoid any potential problems going other routes design-wise. With the protagonist, you could make him do most anything and he'd probably still have a dumb grin on his face the whole time. We were actually a little weary about maintaining that facet of his personality for his dances, but at the end of the day, we agreed that's ultimately part of his charm, and indeed, it's worked out really well. His dances are made that much more fun and unique. Dancing All Night's gameplay was inspired by two popular Sega rhythm titles. The previously mentioned Hatsune Miku Project Diva series, and Mai Mai, a rhythm game arcade cabinet that was originally released in 2012. The core rhythm gameplay is just like Mai Mai. No start in the middle of a circular zone, and move towards an outer rim. Players will need to perform different actions depending on the types of notes on the screen, and make sure to press the corresponding buttons at the right time. The similarities to Mai Mai go beyond just gameplay elements. The shape and colors of the notes are very similar to one another. Another challenge that the developers ran into was making sure that the game was playable despite everything that was going on in the background. I'd say it's been striking the right balance between keeping things flashy on the screen while retaining overall playability. There's a school of thought within rhythm game design that contends that using on-screen flashiness as a means of deliberately obscuring music notes during gameplay is one valid way to ratchet up the difficulty. But personally, I'm of the mind that it's best to maintain some semblance of balance between those two things. So we've really worked hard to ensure the game doesn't cross the line and become inadvertently obtuse to decipher. Project Diva's influence is felt in the game's store and character customization options. In P4D, you'd be able to visit a shop run by Tanaka. In it, you'd be able to purchase items, which are gameplay modifiers, and equipable costumes and accessories. Another element that appears to be borrowed from Project Diva were its difficulty levels. In Project Diva's second, there were four levels, Easy, Normal, Hard, and Extreme. Dancing All Night shares the same four levels, except the name for the hardest difficulty has been changed to All Night. And difficulty was something else that the development team struggled with. They wanted to make sure that everyone would be able to enjoy the game. We want a wide swath of players to be able to enjoy themselves, so we're trying to keep the barrier to entry low. This is especially true with the story mode, which we intend to make so that most anyone can beat it. 
so hopefully that'll help some people overcome their apprehensions that, as a rhythm game, it'll be too hard for them. Nevertheless, we haven't forgotten about advanced players either who are existing genre fans. And for them, we plan to introduce not only a wide swath of difficulty levels to let them engage the game at their skill level, but also additional gameplay elements for them to strive for so they can get the most out of the game. I definitely say that we've spent a lot of time on the difficulty levels too. Back when we were making Catherine, we got really good really quickly at playing our own game. That put us down a dark rabbit hole eventually in terms of balancing, where parts of the game ended up being really hard to beat, suffice it to say. This time with Dancing All Night, we're going out of our way to keep outside players' first impressions in mind and make it a more fair game to play overall. We've got monitoring systems and whatnot in place internally, so rest assured, the game shouldn't turn out to be quite as brutal as what we've made in the past. One of the most striking elements of Dancing All Night is its aesthetic. The game uses a lot of bright, cheerful colors and seems to be heavily inspired by the 1970s and disco. According to Katsura Hashino, the game's creative producer, that's definitely deliberate. What we're going for with the vibe is indeed what the subtitle says, which is making people feel like they can just go out dancing all night long. We've perhaps taken a lot of cues from, say, Saturday Night Fever specifically for it, but that's the basic idea. I think the phrase dancing all night has something of a ring to it, though, personally speaking. Life can be rough out there in the world these days, so we figured it would be nice to make something that was maybe a little less dark and just focused on being flashy and fun. It's meant to be a light and bubbly sort of experience. Being a rhythm game, the music is, arguably, the most important thing to get right. Luckily, they not only had a large collection of songs to pull from, but the team at Atlas wanted to make a game that put the music front and center. It's actually similar to how Persona 4 Arena was created. We had wanted to bring Shigenori Sojima's character art to life by way of a fighting game, and this time we thought it would be nice if Shoji Maguro's music had its turn in the spotlight as the basis for a game. While Maguro's compositions would be prominently on display, Yota Kozuka, who is the sound designer on Persona 4, would be the game's composer. Like everyone else at P-Studio, a subsidiary of Atlas known for developing a particular series of JRPGs, he didn't have any experience working on rhythm games, so there were different things to consider when composing songs. Obviously, in contrast to ordinary RPG music, music in a rhythm game is what ultimately justifies and makes up their existence to begin with, so that has to be kept in mind during the general compositional process. Still, because of the story mode and Dancing All Night specifically, there are times where I've kind of forgotten I'm supposed to be composing music for a rhythm game in the first place, when working on background music for that portion. Also, when it comes to sound design, you have to consider the player's button presses. This plays a key role in making the game feel responsive, and isn't something that you typically have to deal with in RPGs. Those are probably the biggest differentiators from an RPG, yeah. Unless you get good feedback while controlling the game, the whole thing falls flat on its face and loses any sort of appearance it's supposed to have as a music game. So what we've been doing is following along with the sounds in the game really carefully, and then tuning things immediately as issues appear until we get it just right. The game's music would feature songs from Persona 4, Persona 4 Arena, and Persona Q Shadow of the Labyrinth, which was released on June 5th, 2014 in Japan. However, they wouldn't just be copying previously released songs and pasting them into the game. Some songs will also have their original version showing up in the game as well, but the big emphasis is on lots and lots of remixes. I've personally done three remixes myself for it, and at the risk of sounding a little haughty. I'm really proud of the lineup of other artists we've managed to bring on board. There's a good amount of stylistic variety going into this project, and I love that. Alice reached out to several artists to ask them if they would be willing to work with them in remixing some of Persona's catalog. The soundtrack would feature compositions by Tetsuya Kimura, or TK, Daisuke Asakura, Akira Yamaoka, the sound director at Suda51's Grasshopper Manufacturer, and more. According to Kazura Hashino, they were actually surprised that so many people were willing to work with them. We were always aiming for music that at least sounded great, but it's been surprising to see how many artists we've asked actually join us for this project. I wasn't expecting that much support. Tetsuya Kamoro and Daisuke Asakura are the two we're talking about right now, but we've got others working with us that will hopefully bowl everyone over too. It should be fun to see where all of this goes, for both us developers and for players once they get their hands on the final product. As for how they were able to pull this off, they were fortunate enough to have someone with connections to the music industry. Well, initially, for a lot of them. We just sort of fantasized internally about who we would love to work with if the stars aligned in our favor. In more practical terms, we have someone on staff who really knows their way around the music industry here, and thanks to them, we were able to make offers to some really outstanding and talented folks. It's been really humbling to have them all collaborating with us on a project like this. I couldn't be happier. They wanted the soundtrack to be a fun, over-the-top version of what fans would expect from Persona music, but they also wanted there to be a good variety of dance tracks because of the level of talent that they were working with. They gave each artist a lot of creative freedom. As long as the core elements of the songs were recognizable, they could do pretty much whatever they wanted. Everyone that's working with us is already more than capable of doing the work that's been laid out to them. So we more or less let them run wild since we chose them on the basis that their output would mesh well with what we were wanting to achieve with Dancing All Night in the first place. Basically, the only things that we ask that they keep in mind are that the original melodies are still recognizable for whatever song they're remixing, and that they don't make the remixes too lengthy since they need to be used in game. Other than that, they can do whatever they like, and the results have been fantastic. 
everybody's music turned in really unique remixes full of their own personality. Throw in the characters' dances and all the other production value related stuff we have, and the whole thing has become something really special to us. Of course, the songs also work great in isolation too. They're made to be perfectly appreciable just as their own things too. But the game's title theme, Dance, had to be tackled with a different, more specific approach. It had to be immediately recognizable as Persona music and still be able to express this game's unique style and themes. Naturally, if you're going to make a game about dancing, then the theme song should be one that's worth dancing to in and of itself, right? So when looked at from that angle, in my mind, the best era for dance music that fits well for Persona 4 is the 70s. And if you're going to go with the 70s, then it's pretty natural to arrive at putting in disco influences into the mix, which is how I ultimately arrived at the opening song we have now. At first, it was suggested that I just try to blend a bunch of Persona 4 songs together, but that turned out to be harder than I thought. So honestly, I just gave up on that after a while. I wasn't inherently against the idea altogether though, so there is a little bit of pursuing my true self, Persona 4's original opening song, in the final theme. And then once I got help from Shihoko Hirata on the sung vocals and Lotus Juice with the rapping parts. That's when I finally felt like we had arrived at a dance song befitting Persona 4. Unlike what you might expect from a rhythm game, Dancing All Night would feature a lengthy story mode. Similar to the Persona 4 Arena titles, the story will be told in the style of a visual novel, with the game's core gameplay mixed in. It takes place during the summer after Persona 4's ending, chronologically coming after both Arena and Ultimax. Risi has returned to the city to resume her idol career, and at the same time, a strange rumor starts to spread. If you tune into a certain website at midnight, you'll be pulled in, and you'll never wake up again. It's up to the investigation team to get to the bottom of this mystery and save all the people that have gone missing. As you may have guessed, Risi takes center stage here, and the idea for the game to feature her came from one of the game's producers. The idea for Risei to be the star of the game came from one of our producers, Yosuke Uda. He felt that, while it's obviously important to have the music be front and center, fans also come to our games for the narrative, and would expect quality work in that department as well. At that point, the choice was obvious to focus on Risei, when we were hashing out how to make a game that was as much about its music as it was its storyline. I think it works here because the sense of presence that idols have in Japan has been changing recently. It used to be that they were untouchable, someone that belonged in a whole other realm altogether. But nowadays, they feel a lot more personable and down to earth. Of course, it still takes raw talent and a lot of effort to be convincing as an idol in that respect. But I think it works within the context of Persona, because the games already have this sort of realism towards how they depict high school life, and a lot of people are able to connect with that setting well, having lived through it themselves. So at that point, it feels like we can naturally take this direction and have a game about show business as Risei experiences it. There's also a new character that's being thrust into the spotlight this time, Kanami Mashita, or as fans call her, Kanami. Even though this is the first time we've gotten a chance to see her, she was actually introduced by name in Persona 4. Kanami is the main star of an idol unit by the name of Kanami Kitchen. Everyone else but her in the unit has disappeared though, with the plot as a result revolving around rescue efforts to go out and save them. Kanami herself is key to the proceedings, so on that end she'll have her own songs and dances specially made for her. She's got a lot of interesting quirks going for her, both inside and out, that make her a really charming character in her own right. Truth be told, at first I wasn't particularly keen on her, but as time's gone on while making the game, I've come around on her and now she's one of my personal favorites. Dancing All Night was always designed with Persona fans in mind. This was one of the reasons that they decided to release the game on the PlayStation Vita. We also had people who purchased Vita systems just to play Persona 4 Golden, so we wanted to give them another Persona game that they can enjoy on that platform. This approach may have limited the game's appeal to newcomers, but they expected that from the beginning. We were thinking it would be about an 8 to 2 ratio, with Persona 4 fans as our main target, especially since we already released Persona 4 Golden for the same console. We did secretly hope to draw in some new players as we developed the game, of course, but our number one goal is for longtime Persona fans to enjoy the title, so we designed it as a must-have item for the fans, making sure that the characters look and feel their absolute best, and putting care into subtle choices and directions throughout the game. As mentioned previously, Persona 4 Dancing All Night was announced on November 21st, 2013, and was scheduled to be released in the fall of 2014 in Japan. More details would trickle out in December, but the next big announcement wouldn't come until February, when Alice announced that the game would be released in North America in 2015 and launched the English website. On June 5th, Alice announced the 2014 E3 lineup, which, to no one's surprise, included P4D. Things would take an unfortunate turn later in the summer though. On September 20th, at Atlas's stage show at that year's Tokyo Game Show, they released a new trailer. In it, the game's release window had been pushed back to 2015. Also, people had noticed that Dingo, the game's primary developers, were no longer listed on the game's website. The next day, Kazuhisa Wada addressed fans in a letter posted to the Persona channel. To everyone looking forward to Persona 4 Dancing All Night, we're very sorry to have kept you waiting. Moving forward, Persona team will be taking primary responsibility for the development of this game while still receiving assistance from Dingo, with all hands on deck working as hard as they can to finally bring this game to you. We're working as best we can with the aim of launching as early as possible next year. 
so please be excited. Things quieted down until early in 2015, when the game's opening theme, Dance, was revealed on February 4th. The next day, a new promotional video came out that announced the game's new Japanese release date, June 25th, 2015. The months leading up to its release were filled with reveals of various character trailers, screenshots, and DLC announcements. Until May 28th, when Alice announced that Dancing All Night would be released in North America that fall. Fans would have the option of purchasing the standard beta release for $49.99 or the limited Disco Fever edition for $79.99. The limited edition release would come with the game's soundtrack, DLC, a Teddy keychain, a Vita skin, and a Vita pouch. Dancing All Night would be released in Japan without any further delays on June 25th. The game was received well and was given a 33 out of 40 from Famitsu, with the reviewers scoring the game 8, 8, 8, and 9 out of 10. The game debuted at second on the Media Create sales chart after its first week on store shelves trailing only Fire Emblem Birthright, and sold 94,036 copies. The release of Dancing on Night may have been responsible for an increase in Vita sales, because Sony's handheld system was the best-selling hardware device that week. Its sales increased from 11,748 the week before to 23,134 the week P4D was released. Shortly after the game's release in Japan, it was announced that it would be arriving in Europe during the same fall release window that was previously announced for North America, but it would be published by NIS America. Alice was also running into a familiar problem, one that they had when bringing over Persona 4 Arena, scheduling conflicts with voice actors. On June 16th, Laura Bailey, the voice actress for Risei Kujikawa in Persona 4, Golden, Arena, and Ultimax, confirmed that she wouldn't be reprising her role in Dancing All Night. Her replacement would be Ashley Birch, who voiced Rei in Persona Q. Naoto would also receive a new voice, with the previous voice actress, Anna Graves, being replaced by Valerie Arum. On July 23rd, Alice announced an official release date of September 29, 2015 for North America without specifying a European release date. Fans in Europe would get official confirmation on August 20th when NIS America announced the release date of November 6, 2015. The game wouldn't receive any further delays and would release in North America on schedule on September 29th. The game was generally well received by critics, racking up a 76 out of 100 on review aggregator Metacritic. The game was widely praised for its music and charm, but critics seemed split on almost everything else. While the story itself was long, especially for a rhythm game, people were divided on its effectiveness in tying dancing into Persona 4's larger narrative and themes. Opinions on the gameplay were also mixed, with some enjoying the game's take on the genre, and others being left disappointed by its lack of depth and variety. Also, a lot of this game's appeal will be lost on those who don't already have an affinity for Persona 4. I think that Aze Media of Shaq News captured the general sentiment pretty well. Even with a few missteps, the presentation for Persona 4 Dancing All Night is as colorful as it gets and a beauty to behold. It's not the greatest concert you'll ever witness, but Persona 4 Dancing All Night gives a solid performance, one that does its catchy soundtrack proud. The game released in PAL regions on time on November 6th. While there weren't any more delays, there was another issue that they had to deal with. The PAL release of the game's Disco Fever Edition had a problem. One of the songs on the soundtrack was missing, and it didn't take very long for people to discover that something was off. NAS America would confirm that there was a manufacturing error that removed track number 39, the P4D version of Who's There, from the disc. They launched a disc replacement program, and all you'd have to do to get a new disc is fill out the form and provide proof of your purchase or the DLC code that came with the limited edition set. Persona 4 Dancing All Night set the stage for future Persona Rhythm spinoffs. Because of its positive reception, P-Studio started developing what would eventually become Persona 3 Dancing in Moonlight and Persona 5 Dancing in Starlight. When both games would release worldwide in 2018, you could purchase the Endless Night Collection, which not only included the two new dancing games, but an HD port of P4D for the PlayStation 4. Unfortunately for anyone who only wanted to play Persona 4's entry into the rhythm genre, the game wouldn't be sold separately, forcing you to buy all three games if you wanted to play it. A quick aside, this issue was only made worse over time. The code that came with the physical release of the Endless Night Collection expired on December 4th, 2020. So if you purchased a copy after this date, or like me, you forgot to redeem it, you were out of a game. I actually contacted Atlas Support and they told me there was nothing they could do. However, while I was conducting research for this video, I saw something interesting. In 2021, it looks like they actually decided to reactivate all the codes. I decided to try it out and as of early July 2022, the codes do still work. You could have avoided the expiring code issue entirely if you bought the collection digitally, but that created its own set of problems. Due to how the PlayStation Store works, if you had already purchased both Dancing in Moonlight and Dancing in Starlight, you would no longer be able to purchase the bundle. And in case you were wondering, there is still no way to purchase Dancing All Night separately. Persona 4 Dancing All Night was released at an interesting time. It didn't start the wave of Persona spin-offs, but it was, arguably, the biggest departure for the series in terms of style and gameplay. Even after Persona 4 Arena was released, most people probably expected any future spin-offs to be either RPGs, like Persona Q, or another fighting game. But the release of Dancing All Night showed that there really wasn't any genre that was off-limits. With its willingness to work with other developers, Alice could squeeze Persona into pretty much any type of game that you can think of, and the stage had been set for adventurous experiments in the years since, and unlimited possibilities in the years to come. 